Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I have the pleasure of being here with uh, Alessandra, with Eisinger. Uh, we're going to give everyone just a few minutes to, to get logged in um, before we get started. Uh, so thank you so much for, for being here today. We look forward to providing you as much information as we possibly can within the next hour. Uh, the Q&A is going to be open. Uh, we're going to go over some questions, some initial questions with regards to the executive orders and all the changes that have occurred. Uh, if you could feel free to just put in your questions, we'll get to them as we can, and, um, and we'll be able to answer them. If we don't, just feel free to reach out to either Alessandra or myself after, and we'll be glad to help you in any way that we possibly can. Thank you again for those uh, of who are logging in. Um, we're giving everyone just a few minutes to get uh, situated and get all the participants logged in. Uh, we do have a Q&A available, so feel free to put your questions in there and we'll get to your answers as we can. Uh, we look forward to providing you uh, information today on what's going on with the executive orders, what's going on with all the changes that's occurred with the CDC, and how this is going to impact our, our associations. Okay, people are still coming in. So still coming in, yeah. <clears throat> you like my new background? Yeah. <laughs> it's no longer my home office. That's it. You're back at the office. At the office. I was going to do it today for one last hurrah from home. But... <laughs> yeah, I, I've been back for a while. I was a, probably one of the only ones in this office for a while. But yeah. I just, I just, I just like working from the office. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so I think we've kind of stabilized. Um, so I think we can get started. Uh, thank you all for again for, for being here today. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Today I have the pleasure of being here with Alessandra. Uh, thank you so much, Alessandra, for, for being here today. And maybe if you could give a, a brief introduction of yourself and, and the firm. Sure. Um, thank you for doing this, Rafael and Affinity. We always love doing these webinars with you guys. My name is Alessandra Stibbelman. I'm a partner and shareholder at Eisinger Law, and I'm board certified in condominium and plan development law. Um, this is going to be one of those webinars that are going to go really fast, I think, because we'll get a lot of questions and we have a lot of information to give to you guys. Um, my firm Sorry, I'm all over the place. My firm specializes in representing condominiums and HOAs. So this is our niche. This is what we do. And we've been very active in the last uh, year, year and a half in doing a lot of these webinars. I know we've done a few with you guys, which has been fantastic. Um, so just looking forward to being of assistance and um, hopefully answering some of the questions that are coming in. Um, let's, let me just go back to our disclosure, just to be clear. Um, we don't have to read it out loud, but just so you guys know, this is not, this is for informational purposes only. We're not providing legal advice and just make sure that if you have a specific question, you consult with your HOA or condo attorney. This is, we're going to address matters generally, but keep in mind, this is not specific legal advice. Okay. And Raphael, did you give an intro on affinity? No, not yet. Uh, thank you, Alessandra. So uh, for, as for myself, my name is Rafael Aquino. I am the co-founder and CEO of Affinity Management Services. Uh, we've also had the pleasure of hosting several of these webinars with, uh, with Alessandra, and it's always a pleasure. I want to thank you and your team, Josh and, and Ashley, that work behind the scenes to make these, uh, these webinars happen. Without them, I don't think that any of this would, would, would happen. Um, also, I wanted to thank all the board members and the managers that are here today for taking the time out of your day to gain some, a different, uh, some additional knowledge, I should say. Uh, trust me that both us on the professional side, we're, we're constantly being thrown a ton of things just as you are. We, we did our best to be able to decipher the information so that you can grab this information and be able to apply these concepts at your association or at least have a better understanding of how to deal with it. With regards to Affinity, uh, we are an association management company. We service just shy of about 60 associations throughout Miami-Dade County and Broward County and Palm Beach County, I should say, totaling 10,000 units. Uh, we're definitely not a very large organization, but we're definitely not a mom and pop. We're, we're just that right size for those associations that are looking for a bit more of a boutique service. Uh, so enough about me, Alessandra. I think uh, people are here really to start listening to what's going on with all the emergency orders. I know DeSantis. Uh, recently uh, outlined some new, uh, new order. So maybe you can go over that and give our listeners uh, the, uh, an update on everything that's going on. 
Sure. Okay. So let's get right to it. We know that originally when COVID started, there was a state of emergency that was issued. And that state of emergency triggered several powers that associations have pursuant to the emergency statute. That state of emergency um, and the powers provided pursuant to the statutes are somewhat limited, but very helpful. And it has subsequently, as of, I believe, a few weeks ago, it's been extended until June 26, 2021. So that means that technically we are still under a state of emergency. The board still has certain authority pursuant to those statutes in order to protect the safe and welfare of its residents. However, Along with extending the state of emergency, our governor issued several executive orders. The first one prohibited COVID-19 vaccine passports. This one does apply in our opinion to associations, essentially any business in Florida, whether private, government, um, whatever you may be, you're not allowed to request vaccine documentation. Um, they don't, they, this order doesn't prohibit a business from doing screenings, but you're not allowed to actually ask for proof of vaccination. Now, obviously that raises a lot of issues given CDC's changes to their guidance from last Thursday that kind of just threw us all for a whirlwind. So aside from that, there were also two executive orders um, that were issued on the same day, which essentially invalidates any emergency order um, that restricts rights, liberties of individuals and their businesses. And in, but it doesn't apply to associations, right? This one is one that applies only to county and municipalities. And it essentially says that any executive or I'm sorry, any orders um, or emergency orders that a municipality, a city or a county may have issued pertaining to COVID are no longer in effect. Um, and this would be effective July 1st, but meanwhile, um, there are restrictions. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if that's actually accurate as far as this executive order, because there was a statute that was passed that holds this. The statute is effective July 1st. The order, I believe, was effective immediately. So I just wanted to correct that. Um, and then this executive order also deals with the fact that the counties or municipalities cannot reinstate these executive orders. Um, it also does not address privacy rule, private rules or rules and regulations established by the association. Um, and based on this, we're left in a situation without going into the legalese, we're left in a situation where we, the county and the city are not allowed to continue enforcing or impose new emergency orders, but we are still under a state of emergency. CDC last Thursday, as you guys know, said that if an individual is vaccinated, they no longer need to wear a mask inside. So one of the main issues that we've been dealing with, and Raphael, correct me if I'm wrong or if um, you have something um, different, but one of the main questions we've been getting is, well, what does that mean for our community? Can we still require that the residents wear masks? Um, and that's been the main question. This was an issue before this change in the CDC guidance, we had a lot of people that were vaccinated, didn't wanna wear masks or wanted reasonable accommodations, claiming that because of their medical situation, sometimes even their religious or whatever they were relying upon, they found that they needed to be exempt from the association's rules and regulations pertaining to um, the requirement to wear a mask. And the association, if the association had a proper rule that required masks within the common elements, then arguably the association had to, if sufficient evidence was provided to grant the reasonable accommodation. Now we're at a place where Starbucks, I believe Target, you know, all the main- Publix, public, Trader Joe's, like, yeah. No one's requiring masks. So yeah. can the association still require it? And we're of the position that Yes, if the association properly passed or wishes to pass a rule requiring that masks be worn in the common elements, then it has the right to enforce that. Um, now, you're still going to get the people that don't want to wear it, and you certainly don't want to have a rule that you don't have the ability to enforce or that doesn't have any teeth, as we say. However, if it's 
within the board's authority to pass reasonable rules and regulations. We are still under technically a state of emergency, which gives the associations the ability to monitor the situation. If there's an outbreak in your immediate community, in your association or in your neighborhood, and you feel that you need to impose certain measures again in order to protect your residents, then you certainly have the authority to do that. Just make sure that you do it at a properly noticed board meeting and that you communicate with the residents. Um, Ultimately, I think that it needs to be reasonable. That is a standard for these rules and regulations. So it arguably wouldn't be reasonable to require people to wear masks in the pool or outside, but it, depending on the size of your clubhouse, depending on um, what amenities we're dealing with, you may still have the ability to enforce certain social distancing or mask mandates. Yes, and, and you're right, Alessandra. I mean, from a management perspective, right, we've been receiving a lot of different questions. Um, ultimately, uh, as you know, I've stated before in different webinars, is, is we do rely heavily on the partners that we work with. So if an association wants to take a certain direction, obviously we can provide a, a, a basic opinion, but we'll really refer that over to the attorney because there's been so many changes. Um, I mean, as an organization, right, we're, we're doing our own assessment of what direction we're going to take. And then here comes Thursday, Thursday with the CDC uh, guidelines auto, automatically changed. So that, that changed everything in the direction which we were headed towards. So a lot of things have been changing. Uh, it's important to do what you're doing right now as a board member is attending these kinds of webinars and really reaching out to, to your partners. It is a little bit confusing between, are we still in an emergency order? I thought DeSantis uh, removed it. But as Alessandra said, stated, um, if, if you do pass that as a rule, then technically the association, you have the, you, you have the, the abilities to be able to enforce it. Now, the question does come is, do you have the resources as an association to really enforce that? So a lot of that is dependent on your association, the size of the association, the type of staff that you have within the association. So all these factors need to be um, taken into play uh, in order for, for you to make the best business decision uh, for your association. Right. Uh, so, um, yes, so go ahead. We have some, some questions coming in. Um, and again, when we were preparing for this, <clears throat> For this webinar, you know, we we had to wait until the last minute because we don't know what's going to come up. Um, so normally we have a lot of PowerPoint and information, but we really wanted this to be a, more of a Q and A. So feel free to have the questions coming in. Um, I did see one um, about the DVPR suspending the state of emergency last June. The DVPR never suspended the state of emergency. What they did is they withdrew an order recognizing certain powers. Um, it was, I believe, based on some pushback from the Realtor Association and the lobbying um, in regards to being allowed to restrict certain individuals within a community, which has been addressed by legislation that will be effective July 1st. However, it was never suspended. Uh, the DVPR is a government agency. It doesn't have the right to suspend a state of emergency that's issued by the governor. And in fact, the governor has extended this state of emergency. It just became an issue of what powers really does an association have that are deemed an emergency power and are those ones that can be applied to a pandemic versus a hurricane, which is how the statute was originally drafted. So um, a lot of this has been addressed in the legislative changes that are gonna, um, that have already been approved and will be effective July 1st. But overall, um, I, I just wanted to make that clarification because we do have the right under certain emergency powers to impose reasonable rules as you would without the emergency powers. Mm -hmm. You have the right to, to um, reschedule certain meetings and to do certain things um, such as the Zoom meetings that we are still dealing with. And actually that was another question. Um, yeah, we have a, a, a good one here that, that kind of goes into both. It says, Luann asks, uh, could there be a limited mass requirement for visitors to the management office when dealing with the management staff, not necessarily for the entire condo area? Um, so, you know, that's interesting. I think that as long as the board properly adopts rules and regulations and they have a reasonable basis that has you know, that makes sense. I mean, common sense goes a really long way here. If you have mm -hmm. a small management office and management doesn't feel comfortable working in your community because of the no mask, then certainly um, if someone's going inside a closed space with the doors closed, and since you can't ask if they're vaccinated or not, I don't see why you wouldn't require it, but it's going to be, I, I don't know in your community if there's other areas that also 
should have that mandate or not? And are you just saying that? And what about your front desk person? What about the gym? What about other areas? So you kind of have to look at the community as a whole. And I would definitely run any regulation or restriction that the board adopts by your legal counsel to make sure that it is reasonable and properly written and can be uniformly enforced because you don't want to deal with discriminatory claims or selective enforcement um, defenses. Correct. And, and if it does become a little bit, I mean, that's the challenge that, that we're having because you're going to have buildings that are going to decide or associations or clubhouses, whatever it may be, that do decide, okay, we don't want to follow certain mandates. We want to lift all masks uh, similar to what the CDC is requiring or, or, or uh, requesting. Um, but it does become a challenge for, let's say, management. I mean, those are decisions that if as an organization, we want to make sure that our employees are protected. Uh, we may say, hey, listen, we want our team members to wear masks. So this is where it becomes a little bit complicated because obviously with the, with DeSantis order stating that we don't have the ability to request if someone has had a vaccine with passports and so forth, you know, you may have employees that may have decided not to get the vaccine. Um, so as an organization, what, you know, what we're analyzing and deciding is, you know, what's going to be the right thing from the looks of it, it's going to be more of the conservative approach, which is keeping our team members with the mask on, because we don't have the right to ask whether they decided to take a vaccine or not. And also, ultimately, we are here to serve um, our residents. And so we have a duty to protect them as well. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the approach that we're taking. But for those boards that are self managed properties, uh, these are things that you should be taking into consideration, because ultimately, you want to take care of your team because your team is what's been able to get you through um, this situation uh, with COVID. Um, and guys, just real quick, I see some questions coming in on the chat. We're, if you can do them in the Q&A so we can keep track of what we answered and what we didn't, just go ahead and put your question on the Q&A. That would be easier. Um, I have here one, Alessandra, that, that from Faye, and basically that, that uh, she asked, what about lifting restrictions related to the guests at the pool? Guests as in... Um, all I'm right. assuming, yeah, I'm assuming right. guests that, that are coming into the community. So I'm assuming as yeah. if a resident I mean, invited. It's this is so community specific, right? I mean, yeah. we have some condo hotels um, and associations that have guests coming in and flying in and leaving on a regular basis, or very international communities where. I, I would say, I don't know if those individuals have had the ability to get vaccinated or vaccinated mm -hmm. and you can't inquire. So now you're opening up the pool, you're allowing them to bring their friends. And yes, I think you absolutely have every right to do it. It's just a concern and you have to look at it from the liability perspective, which although limited by statute, still is there as far as what is in the best interest of the community, of your employees, and whether or not it makes sense. And if you're not going to open it and you have restrictions in place, are they reasonable considering everything else that is going on in the world? Um, it really is a very case-specific analysis, analysis because essentially everything has been lifted. So if you wanted yeah. to open up your whole community and say no one needs to wear masks, I mean, I, I'm not recommending that, but yeah. I don't think there's anything that would prevent you from doing that. Um, so ultimately it, it's a situation where you have to analyze your community and the type of residents that you have, whether they're local, whether they're international, whether you have a very transient population in your condominium or HOA. Um, the other thing we talked about in preparing for this, Raphael, and you said that my mom's side came out, is really kids because kids we know are not getting vaccinated. So you, if you're in a family friendly building with a lot of families and kids are in school and they're not wearing masks and we know they're not vaccinated and you have maybe a playground, maybe the playground is outside, maybe it's inside. I mean, you have to consider that young kids are not getting vaccinated and that's also a way for the virus to spread within your community or to, to others that maybe can't or chose not to get vaccinated. So. You, you really do need to consider on a case by case basis for your community what makes the most sense. Um, there's so many uh, questions coming in. Yeah, so we have one here from Lynn and Lynn asked in a condominium, can we mandate mask wearing for non-vaccinated employees? And for vaccinated employees, can we go without masks? Or do all employees um, or, or should all employees wear masks? Well, in my opinion, you can't ask them, are you vaccinated or not? And you can't ask for proof of vaccination. So that creates a very, it creates an administrative nightmare where I do think that it has to be all or nothing because 
Um, if you allow people to go without masks under the understanding that they're vaccinated and they're not, um, or I, I mean, it just, uh, in, in my recommendation would be an all or nothing. And what Raphael opened up with as to, from the management perspective and for the safety of his employees, since we can't ask who's vaccinated and who isn't, then maybe everyone should wear masks until we get to whatever the next step will be in this pandemic or uh, right. whatever ends up happening. Um, yeah. And, and the same thing goes, you see, we have a question here from Anonymous that asks, can we mandate employees to get vaccines? So, you know, I, I haven't heard of any opinion that states that you, you can mandate someone. Our approach is, has been slightly different, like associations should take a slightly different approach, similar to what the CDC and our government is doing. In my opinion, they've lifted all these um, these orders. Uh, they've lifted these uh, demands that we've had is to make sure that people get vaccinated. I think it's a way of promoting individuals to make sure that you take your time to get vaccinated. So if you're a self-managed community or if you have ways to maybe motivate your employees to do so, then you should, whether it be okay, we'll give you half a day off, uh, whatever it may be. And that way it kind of motivates them to do what they need to do. But requiring them to, to have a vaccine um, I, I don't know. I don't know what your opinion is, uh, Alessandra, on that. So, so um, I, I'm not sure I, that I'm qualified to give that opinion. I, I would reach out to an employment attorney. Um, I've heard various different answers to that question, and it's changed based on how the law has changed in the last few weeks. So yeah. um, I think that if I were to answer that a few weeks ago, I would have said yes. And now I'm <laughs> saying I'm not sure. And <laughs> Um, I would just be careful with mandating anything at this point in regards to vaccinations, because then you still have to be subject to the exemptions, and then you're going to be doing that analysis for your employees, and are you acting in a certain way that can lead to a discriminatory claim? I mean, Correct. it's just a whole can of worms that you open. Um, there's a good question here about how this affects the other restrictions regarding the capacity and the hand sanitizer and all that, and I think that ultimately from the association perspective, to the extent that you feel comfortable lifting those restrictions as far as capacity, I think that you have the ability to do that because none of those local restrictions are still in place by virtue of those executive orders. So you don't have to limit the amount of people in your pool. You don't have to limit how many people are inside of a closed space. Um, so it, it kind of puts the association in a very tough situation where the board members who are volunteers still have the responsibility to ensure the safety of their residents and their employees and the guests and invitees, but local government can't enforce anything. The governor's telling us that, you know, we're open, everything is going on, business as usual, but there's still cases, there's still variants. So, you know, it, it has to be a decision made by the board with the advice of management, of legal, and um, understanding the situation in their community based on their location, based on their size, based on their residents. Um, but I, I certainly think that those restrictions to the extent that the board passed it by virtue of a rule probably need to be amended. If you haven't had a board yeah. meeting since you passed very restrictive rules for COVID, it's probably time to sit down and see what are we still going to enforce and make sure to communicate that to your residents because that tends to be when people people get mad when they don't know what's going on and when they feel like the association isn't acting properly or isn't taking into account what's going on in the outside world so communicate have that open board meeting discuss the circumstances let your residents know that you're considering keeping some restrictions perhaps or maybe not um, but do it in an open board meeting, talk to your council beforehand, find out if there's any concerns based on your specific community and, and then go from there. Yeah, I, I would strongly urge uh, to, to discuss it with council. I know we've had several, especially the HOAs, um, I should say more condos, but even with the HOAs uh, where they're trying to open the pools now because summer's coming, kids are going to be out. Um, they want to be able to use their pools because most of these homes don't, don't have a pool. The pool is the common area pool. Um, but either way, as a board, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't continue to, you know, keep some of the supplies for the hand sanitizer, having someone maybe cleaning around. Maybe it's a business decision of you as a board to say we want to get we want numbers to get to an X percentage before we loosen up on, on some of the extra cleaning or whatever it is that we're doing. Remember, as a board, these are business decisions that you have to make. And ultimately, as a board, you should be agreeing on these decisions and you should be consulting with council so that whatever decisions you're making, should you find yourself in a tough predicament, you can heavily lean on your uh, attorney and their opinion when they provide it at that time. 
I know I've been asked Alessandra several times, Larry asked the question here in the Q&A, and if the question is, is what's the board's liability if they do decide to lift all the orders? Um, well, according to a new statute that goes into effect in July, the association would arguably not be liable for COVID-related infections should the association be following all the local ordinances. Since there are none, it <laughs> makes it really hard to follow them. So um, arguably, the statute makes it very difficult where you have to have something in writing from a physician connecting the spread of or how you contracted it to um, the location or to the venue. And it, it makes it a lot more difficult liability wise, but that doesn't mean that there won't be some other way around it. Um, a, a negligence claim. I mean, the, the whole thing is if you impose rules and you're not enforcing it, then you have a problem because then you're liable for not enforcing it. They may find ways to come after the association uh, behind the scene type of thing, not maybe directly so that it's difficult to prove through the statute, but they can go after the association a different way. So you definitely want to still follow your procedures that are in place. If you're gonna modify them, do them at a properly noticed board meeting. Make sure that your staff, your employees, management, everyone's on the same page about this and it's properly communicated to the residents, to the membership, to their guests. Um, you wanna make sure that there's a, a very a lot of transparency during this process, as we've said from the beginning of COVID, because there's a lot of unknowns because you know, who knows, maybe tomorrow, and we all certainly hope not, but maybe there's a variant and we need to go back right? Or maybe there's an outbreak in a certain community and you guys as board members need to be ready to address those concerns. So you don't want to just drop everything, stop cleaning or doing anything because we still have a situation. It's just, we can't enforce the local, well, the local government can't enforce their guidance um, and their restrictions. And it's really almost left up to the association as a private not-for-profit entity to determine to what extent it's going to require restrictions in order to keep the safety and well-being of its residents and um, occupants. Yeah. Uh, I, saw, I saw a question here about fining and it's interesting because I'm seeing a lot of news articles and a lot of litigation coming out of this for, you know, we always say that you have to have teeth. So if you're going to impose a mask mandate, then you need to have the mechanism to enforce it. And one of the mechanisms that associations have had to enforce their rules and regulations is going through the fine procedure. Now, keep in mind, if you're going to fine, any fining authority, according to the statute, is up to $100 or $1,000 for 10 days of a continuing violation. A mask violation would be per incident. And every time that you issue a fine, First, the board needs to meet and issue the fine. Then you need to give 14 days notice to the occupant or the member or the guest of a hearing in front of a grievance committee made up of three individuals that are not related to the board members and not living with them and not biased in any way that are members of the association. And those individuals get to decide whether to approve or disapprove the fine, that's it. So every time you issue a fine of $50 or hundred dollars, you're gonna have to go through this fining process. For condos, it's not lienable. For HOAs, if the fine is over a thousand for a continuous violation, so maybe there's a way to say that someone coming in and out of the lobby without a mask for 10 consecutive days is a continuous violation, and therefore maybe you can come up with a good argument to lean on that basis. But I find that very difficult to justify if you go in front of a judge that you're foreclosing on someone's home because they refuse to wear masks and they've incurred so many fines. Um, there's other ways you can go into court, you can get an injunction, um, but no one wants to go the legal route because it costs money. Um, so, you know, I think education and communication is very helpful because maybe people share different views, but if they can be respectful of others, um, I think that goes a long way. But, you know, as far as liability goes, and I know I went on a tangent, um, liability is interesting question because no one really knows what's going to come out of it. And as far as fining, you can try. You're just going to have a hard time collecting those fines and enforcing it. And you better have done it the proper way for it to hold up um, in case it's challenged. Correct. And also keep in mind that uh, you, you, you're going to have to do that across the board. So if you do it for one, you're going to need to do it the same uh, for every individual within that, that association. I have a question here from Georgia, which is a pretty a pretty great question, which she asks is, 
Since masks are no longer required, does that mean if a staff member contracts COVID, do the condo still need to pay for their time off for recovery until the test is negative? So that's actually a great question that you're probably gonna have to ask your managing partner when it comes to their HR department when it comes to it. We're actually assessing that at the moment as well. Though from what we've been made aware of as of last week, as Alessandra stated earlier, a lot of things have changed. You still needed to pay the, the 14 days. Um, however, as a tip, it's very important that you at least get uh, uh, verification that it is a, a COVID test that they took and that there were that there were that they did test positive. I'm sorry. So that's a great question, Georgia. You will have to relate to either your managing partner's HR department, or you're going to have to relate your self managed to whatever um, company is providing you your payroll services. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so. We're, we're seeing questions about people without masks required to carry proof, vaccination cards. No, you cannot do that because our governor has said we cannot demand proof of vaccination. I, I saw another question here. Well, what if um, members voluntarily want to tell us that they have been vaccinated? Okay, but you can't impose rules that discriminate against and that allow people to go into the pool if they're vaccinated and they can't go in if they're not vaccinated because essentially you're requiring vaccination in order to use the common element. So that would be a direct violation of the executive orders. Um, and I do not recommend doing that and do not feel like it would be legal if challenged. Um, I have a question here from Giovanni, which had to do a little bit with where you were about a minute ago. So let's say maybe they, if they find the individual and then they decide to revoke the access to the common areas, uh, what's your take on that? I mean, I know per statute, technically it's permitted, but what, what's your take on that? So they can certainly use that remedy if they have the proper procedures in place. They issue the fine. If they don't pay the fine and they owe an amount due to the association and they're delinquent for over 90 days, or if they're violating the rules and regulations, and then based on that, you decide to suspend the use rights for the common areas, it again comes down to teeth. Are you able to enforce it? And if that individual doesn't comply with it, are you going to be sending your management or your security guard to have a confrontation with that individual? Or are you going to be sending it to the attorney to send that letter of enforcement? Are you going to be pursuing it by going for an injunction in court to require that they uh, comply? Because otherwise, it just becomes this exercise of trying to enforce something that you really don't intend to enforce. And if you don't do it unilaterally, and if you don't have the ability to restrict their access, just imposing the suspension is kind of this useless exercise. Right. Um, so the statute does give the association certain remedies if they violate the rules or regulations. So arguably, yes, you can go through the proper procedures. I think it's 718.303 for condos and there's a, a 720 statute that and a 719 that deals with fines and suspensions as well. So that's definitely a route to go. But I have a feeling that by the time that we're done with all of this, uh, there will be a new rule or something that will change our opinion. So just, you know, keep in mind that enforcement takes time and you have to kind of be creative with if you don't have the ability to enforce and you don't feel comfortable with everyone in one room, then maybe keep that room closed for the time being. Right. I mean, those are decisions, business decisions that the board needs to to undertake if. There's a playground and kids are going to be home and you're not feeling comfortable requiring that all the kids wear masks, then maybe you don't open up the playground right away. Or maybe you continue to implement those cleaning procedures, even though the playground is open, because you understand as a board member that there's still a risk of transmission. All right. And I have a question here from Bernard that I'll take here. It says, it says our management company has a policy regarding their employees wearing masks, et cetera. Do we as a board have to accept their that uh, their policy? So I would say first and foremost, review your agreement because there may be some language within the agreement that does allow the management company to make certain decisions because the employees do belong. Um, most of the cases, again, you have to review your agreement, uh, do belong to the, the management company. I will tell you, at least from, from our perspective, um, if they are doing that, you know, they're, I believe they're taking a proactive measure um, to protect your residents. Uh, so I don't see, you know, what the impact would be to your residents if you had your management team wearing a mask. Again, also, you want to take into consideration the people and the human aspect of it as well. So your employees maybe don't feel comfortable because of the amount of individuals that they're having contact with. So I'll give you a perspective. If you have a 500 unit building, they're probably in contact front desk, maybe with 1, 1,500 people a day, if not more, between deliveries, packages, and so forth. So they may not feel comfortable um, not wearing a mask. 
and they have made, made a personal decision to, to wear a mask. So you do have to keep these things uh, into consideration. Again, we're big believers in taking care of, of the personnel. Um, so, so it's important that as board members and as leaders of your community, that you keep the, these things in mind, because as a board member, maybe you interact with four or five residents as you come in and out of, out of an elevator. However, your janitorial maintenance and management staff are, are probably going to have much more contact with much more individuals within the association. Correct. And, and I, I agree. I think you guys, we have to remember the human aspect of this. Everyone has individual circumstances. You don't know what if that employee or that staff member can't be vaccinated and for whatever reason, medical reason, or has a personal choice and chose not to be vaccinated. And now you're saying don't wear a mask that's almost putting your residents at risk as well. So you have to do a risk analysis there to determine what is the best scenario and work with your management. They're not imposing restrictions on their employees to, to piss off the association, excuse my language. They're doing it because their, their employees need protection. And now if you have an issue with it, you may have a contractual dispute with management or a liability issue with management separate and apart from anything else because you didn't allow their employee to protect themselves. So now you're, you're opening up a whole can of worm as far as liability goes that may or may not be protected by the statute passed um, that goes into effect. Um, there's a question here about uh, if the pool is closed, but use it at your own risk, um, does that cover us for liability? Um, Tony, I'm not sure that anything that you write, or even if you have them sign waivers, which some communities did, um, or even, you know, if you required masks, you're never 100% protected from liability. And it seems a little bit weird that you would have the pool closed, but allow those to use it at their own risk. It's either it's open and use at your own risk or it's closed, do not go in. But I think that message in and of itself is a little bit confusing. And again, we want to try to be really clear. If you impose rules and regulations, do it uniformly. Do it in a way where there's no um, room for analysis and how you enforce it and who you're enforcing it against. Try to keep it basic, even though there are going to be case by case exemptions and issues. Try to pass your rules so that you're, you're, you're not unintentionally discriminating or attacking anyone as a result. So at, speaking of those rules, Alessandra, I have a question here from Mark that kind of uh, segues into that. And do board members have the power to impose rules under the emergency authority without a properly noticed meeting? You know, my opinion was that they didn't have that authority to begin with, even under without emergency authority. I mean, it, you got to think of the emergency as does it still allow us to have a board meeting? Um, I, I would not recommend if you want to have teeth to your rule. Notice a meeting with 48 hours notice and do it open. I mean, board members can still attend via Zoom because attendance tele, uh, via telephone or Zoom counts for quorum purposes. So you can technically in a condominium have a Zoom meeting, adopt the rules. If it pertains to the use of the unit, give the 14 days prior notice so that you cover all your bases. Because again, this is not the type of thing that you want to um, do without the transparency and risk being challenged after the fact. So if there is a water leak and you need to address it, that's an emergency. If you're imposing rules because of a pandemic that's been ongoing for a year and a half, I don't know if that would be justified even under a state of emergency given everything else that's going on and the executive orders that are in place. Right. And let's say they decided to have a board meeting. I also ask here, you know, uh, if they start having a board meetings in their clubhouse with 20 people or probably 50 to 60 people attending, um, I think that's going to depend, Elsa, on the size of your clubhouse uh, and so forth, even though technically everything has been lifted. Um, Alessandra, I don't know if you want to chime in there with regards to, I guess, the capacity is probably the, the question. And I'm not sure if the CDC, the, the current guidelines that have been adopted by our governor officially, if they address um, the, the size of the venue and, and limitations, uh, even if they don't, I mean, you got to be smart about it. If you can't require that people wear masks, are you as an individual comfortable being in a room with 60 other people with no masks? You, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. So why have that board meeting? And given everything that's changed over the last year or so, why not give people the option to attend electronically? 
um, and have more participation as a result of it. Um, allow those that may not be local or maybe are immunocompromised or don't feel comfortable doing that still participate. So allow people to show up and have it electronically so that you reduce the amount of people in a room. I mean, th that would be my suggestion. It really depends on the size of the room, the ability to socially distance. Um, again, on your residents, are they just all gonna show up without a mask and you know they're anti-vaccine or they're not going to get vaccinated and now you have an event where a bunch of people contract the COVID. I mean, yeah. liability wise or not, it doesn't look good and it's not going to, it's not going to go well. So I still wouldn't recommend it. I have here a question that'll lead into with regards to board meetings. It says from Sharon, uh, my board has been holding all their board meetings via Zoom since COVID started. Now that the emergency has been uh, ended by the governor, can they continue to hold their meetings via Zoom? We didn't put here if it was a condo or HOA. Right. So I, I believe for HOAs, um, attendance via video conferencing for board members may not count for quorum. For condos, yes. Um, and I would just confirm with your attorney. But overall, I still feel that because we're still under a state of emergency, you can still do it. Once the June 26th, um, I believe it was June 26th ends and we're not under a state of emergency, then I have a very difficult time justifying um, attendance via Zoom for quorum purposes. Although I believe the statutes were amended. I'd have to check on that effect of July 1st. That may change for HOAs. Um, but even so, you know, it's a good idea to keep the board meetings for condos via Zoom. Um, even if the board members are in the same room, it, it does allow for participation. You can record the meetings. It makes minutes easier. It keeps, um, it memorializes what you're doing as a board. So it, I, I don't see why you couldn't still do it. If you're an HOA, check with your council um, just for quorum issues. But other than that, I, I'm, I would okay. say I'm all about the zooming all day long. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I would agree. I mean, I, I'm, I'm hopeful of so far from what we've seen, even though things were still dealing with the challenge of COVID, but obviously the numbers are slightly different than they were about a year ago. Um, I have seen a lot of board members are still utilizing Zoom. Um, they have gotten their opinions from, from the attorney in certain instances, maybe what the recommendation is to just have one board member either uh, at that meeting with the TV, let's say, so that they could see the rest of the board members. There's different ways that you could manage the situation, but I have seen participation from residents much higher on Zoom, and actually the participation is different, right, depending how you host your meeting. If you host it a similar way as how we're hosting this webinar is webinar style, you can have a little bit more control with regards to how the meeting is conducted. You just want to make sure that you're answering the questions that are in the Q and A, um, oh. so you're addressing everyone's concerns. Well, there's um, no there's no mute button in real life, yeah, right? Correct. So, so <laughs> it's actually made some for some of my associations. It's made conducting business a lot easier because yes. they can actually do business at a board meeting and go through the items and still allow people and unmute them, allow them to talk. But if they go on a rampage or they just want the stage and they go past their three minutes, then you can, you, you know, you can tell them, no, you're passing the rules. And I, I always like, you know, even though we're all relatively familiar with Zoom, I like to go through the procedures at a board meeting. We're going to mute everyone. The board is going to talk. If you have any questions, raise the hand through Zoom or go like this and we'll see you or whatever the case may be so that everyone knows that they still have the right to participate. We're not changing that by virtue of doing it via Zoom. We're just doing it like this so that we have more attendance, so that everyone feels safer and so that we can reach more members. Correct. And, and you even get more participation from, you know, the, there's a quality of life aspect as well for your manager. Um, there's a difference when you can leave the office at 536, you know, get your kids in order to do what you need to do and then participate in your board meeting at 730 from the comfort of your home. And the same thing goes with regards to cost. Um, uh, not a I mean, I like this one, but, you know, your attorney costs are going to be less. You don't have driving time back and forth. Yeah. No, and even the participation from them, it, it's okay because it's quick. They'll pop up the computer. I'm here for 30 minutes, close the computer, and they get back to their life and their it's, quality. It's a, lot, it's a lot easier for me to be dismissed from a board yeah. meeting once my attendance is no longer needed. Right. Uh, the board doesn't feel awkward keeping me there. They're not paying me for extra time. You know, it, it's actually been something that I've seen over the last year. I have, I've attended a lot more board meetings because yeah. it's convenient. I've Correct. seen management attendance go up in board meetings. Um, and I think 
think it's very helpful because we're not dealing with a travel time issue, whether you're down the street or not, getting in the car, going somewhere, doing the chit chatting, getting there early. I mean, with Zoom, it's bam, bam, you get to business and you really, it does allow you to be very effective. So I think it's a great tool and it will be, it's a great advantage that we've acquired as a result of the crazies, as we all the craziness. Um, um, ultimately to allow us to be able to do this. Um, so Florida is still under a state of emergency, um, even though the governor has suspended any restrictions. Just I, There was a request for clarification. I just wanted to make that clear. Um, okay, so just, I, I'm not even going to address this. I'm not saying wrong information. There was a question about children needing to be playing outside with fresh air without mask on. That's an opinion. I'm not giving an opinion. I mean, at the end of the day, if the board wants to allow children outside in fresh air, I have three kids. I truly believe that, that it's a huge advantage. They're back in school. It's fantastic. But if you're not going to be cleaning the equipment, if you're recognizing that they're not vaccinated and if they're not wearing masks and you have an outbreak, I mean, there is some concern there if they're at a association sanctioned event or if they're on association property. Um, but I, I'm not necessarily advocating one way or the other. I really think that depending on your community, the board members need to consider the risks. And um, I, I do think that it's it's definitely taken a huge um, emotional and developmental toll on our kids. No doubt about it. Um, I, I've seen it, and um, I, I have a lot of a lot of friends with kids. You know, we're seeing it all. So. You know, I, I don't want anything that I say here today to be misconceived as an opinion of what any community should be doing, because that's not my job. These are business decisions for the community. What we're here to give, at least my role here today, is to give you some legal analysis based on what's existing in the legal world as far as the executive orders, the emergency orders, what it means, and what associations still have the power to do. And if the board of your association feels that it needs to still protect the safety and still requires masks outside, inside, whatever the case may be, then they still have the authority to impose reasonable rules and regulations. Um, and that's what I was responding to. Um, I have a question here, Alessandra, from Larry. Uh, he's from a co-op. He's asking, uh, board meetings count as a quorum with Zoom? Uh, my intention is to do both attend and Zoom together. You know, I'm not sure off the top of my head if the if Chapter 719 allows board members to attend uh, via video conferencing. I would think yes, because generally 719 follows 718. Um, and if not, we're still okay doing it because we're still under a state of emergency. So I would just acknowledge that at the board meeting and say, because we're still under a state of emergency, we're still allowing our board members to attend via Zoom and it counts for quorum purposes. And, you know, I think it's going to be really hard for someone to challenge that um, and say that, that it wasn't a proper board meeting because it was via Zoom. If you want to have some board members attend in person and others Zoom in, I think that's okay too. Um, but I would have to take a look at that statute specifically to see what it currently states. And then if you're going to look at that um, or have your attorney look at that and have them look at the, uh, of the new legislation that goes into effect in July to see if it changed it, because I believe it may have, and it may now count for quorum purposes. Yeah. And also keep in mind, Larry, that it's important to just communicate that to your residents, which, whichever way it is that you're, if you're going to host it via Zoom, that you're placing the link and, and the call in number as well, because you can call into Zoom rather than just doing pure video. Um, just make sure that you're communicating that, placing that on your agendas. Uh, we have found now that that before certain board members didn't want certain agendas being uh, set now, we're basically e-blasting agendas all the time. We're still posting it because that's what the statute requires. Uh, but now I'm finding boards that are definitely open to sending agendas, sending uh, the link within the email so then that way all the residents have access um, it's been again as we've stated multiple times throughout the webinar it's been a great way for the residents to really be able to communicate their concerns and get a strong understanding of what's going on uh, within the community all right and and i think i, I don't know maybe i'm not clear because i'm getting some questions that are misunderstanding what we're saying so your board, because we are still under a state of emergency, has the right to keep certain restrictions, but there's by no way required to maintain them. So you can certainly open up all the amenities. There's nothing legally that would prevent you from doing that. Um, as far as a ballroom and the use of a ballroom at your clubhouse, 
I'm not sure that I would feel comfortable advising a client that go ahead, start renting out the ballroom and having parties, but I don't believe there's any restriction that would prohibit that. So as long as you're still following the CDC guidelines without being able to confirm vaccination, which I'm not really sure how anyone can do that. Um, if you know, you're having, you're allowing someone to rent the ballroom to have a 50, hundred person dinner and uh, you're not gonna be enforcing what's going on, the statute tends to protect the association in those cases, but then again, there's still risk. Um, it's still possibly not the best option for communities. I think it's something that you need to slowly ease into it. You don't want to go from fully closed to fully open over time. I think there needs to be a transition. Um, you're probably, as communities, doing more cleaning because these areas are closed. You've um, you've rearranged staff and janitorial staff. So you wanna slowly, these things need to be discussed, organized with management. You wanna figure out how to properly allocate the employees that you have and the services that are being performed to the right areas so that you just don't go from zero to a hundred without proper communication with limitations. Maybe you adopt rules where you open up the ballroom, but you limit the amount of um, people. I would still say that the use of masks needs to be based on CDC guidance. And at the very least, you need to communicate that to the, uh, the people coming in, um, that if you're not vaccinated, you should wear a mask. Whether you can check on it or not, that's the issue. But they should be aware that, you know, that is a CDC requirement and that the association intends to follow the CDC guidance um, and expects their participants to do that. And, and keep in mind that there's ways of, of, of at least finding out uh, or getting a general public overview is just sending a survey out to your residents, whether, you know, would you would you use the pool if we lifted the restrictions um, or would or would you be are, are you would you want the association to consider lifting the full restrictions and just get a public opinion of what's going on with your residents and their thought process. You know, every community uh, is different. It's its own, I like to say, its own organism, and, and they, they each act slightly different. No one knows their community best than those boards that have served for some time. So you know where your challenges um, may be or, or, um, or what, what difficulties you're going to have with your residents. So if you're not too sure, then it, it doesn't hurt, again, to communicate with the residents, send a, a survey out. Um, for those of you that maybe aren't on um, online voting yet, that's a good way to start getting participation up um, on the online voting platforms. Uh, so, so I would strongly urge you to, to do a survey with your residents and, and get their um, opinion if you're concerned as a board of what direction is the right direction to take for your community. What better way of, of hearing it than from your residents themselves? Agreed. Um, so we got a, a question here about whether I have any communities that have lifted all restrictions and what they're facing, um, if they fully open the common areas, um, and if not, what the common rebuttal is for those um, condos that want to remain restricted. Um, I've seen everything. Um, I think I've had some communities that have been open for a while. Um, others have had still restrictions and have still maintained the restrictions. Um, what I usually recommend is that if they're gonna change it, they do it at an open board meeting, they communicate it. I have some that have slowly been easing the restrictions. Um, I think it's a business call for the board. So I think the response needs to be, you know, the, the board has decided and you do it at an open board meeting that it's in the best interest of the community to open up the amenities or to remain closed or to remain with limited occupancy or whatever it is that the board votes to do um, needs to be in the best interest of the community. So. I, I've seen everything from board members opening everything but requiring masks inside and then you get the people that immediately ask for reasonable accommodations and they don't want to wear a mask and they want accommodations to the six foot requirement. I, I don't know under what basis, but I've seen that too. So, you know, you're always going to be dealing with something. There's always going to be pushback. There's always going to be someone that's not going to be happy with why or how or what the board did. And that's just part of what we do um yeah, and you just have part to of part part of being on a board <laughs> part of being on the board part of being yeah. management part of being the management attorney it all falls back on us one way or the other but you know i think that again it depends on the community every community is different with the level of comfort that they have based on the the cleaning uh, protocols they've placed the um 
just how the building is set up, how the community is set up. Is it where you can walk through the clubhouse and the common areas without being close to everyone? Or is it really a small building that you're gonna be exposing each other regardless if you have no mask in the common areas, or maybe you have a restaurant on site and people are gonna be eating. I mean, there's so many variables. Um, so it's really hard to give a, a clear answer to that. But I've seen everything from some that still have their restrictions in place and intend to keep them um, to others that have opened up all the way and others that are slowly opening up. So well, at least from, from, from a management perspective, what we've seen is we've seen a, a combination as well. Um, however, fortunately enough for us, uh, uh, most of, I would say 99% of our clients have listened to the advice of making sure that we get some kind of legal opinion um, in writing so that that way we have a sense of, hey, this was a business decision that was made. We consulted with, with counsel. Uh, the past week, what we have seen is uh, a majority of, of the HOAs, especially those condos that have been closed for a while, or not completely closed, but have been limited, where they want to start lifting the restrictions. Um, some condos, it makes total sense because they have snowbirds. So right now, the count is very low, and it's an easy decision for them. Okay, we're only 30% capacity as a building. We want to lift everything. And that's what they're doing, but but they've had you know um, uh, a legal opinion. So again, I can't stress that that point enough. Um, I know uh, you rely heavily on managers and, and management companies. Um, however, we have to rely heavily on on our partners uh, because you know that that we want to make sure that you're protected as a board member. Right. Um, so we're still going back to the emergency powers here. I have a, a few questions um, from Judy. So Judy. Even though the emergency statute as written talks about damage in response to an event, ultimately that has been interpreted to apply um, overall by practitioners and by the DVPR who then took away their position, but we're under a state of emergency. We do believe that certain emergency powers in the statutes do apply. Is it controversial? Yes. Is it a black and white? I can 100% tell you that if we go to court and it's challenged, no, because this has not been litigated. So even though we said this a lot in the beginning, we're still in a state of unknown. Everything is changing very quickly. A lot of these cases are getting to court. And by the time they get to court, it's not even applicable anymore because everything has changed. So there is some litigation and case law that's going to develop out of this that may guide us a little bit better in the event we have another pandemic or another state of emergency. But Right now, it's still all up in the air. We're still trying to interpret, and it goes, it's a day by day. This is new to everybody, to you guys as residents and board members, to management and to attorneys, and there's not that much precedent to rely upon. Um, so it's really a matter of interpretation and of acting reasonable and using common sense at the end of the day. Um, Let's see, any other must answers? How are we doing on time? We have five minutes left. So if, if, if any of you have any questions that you'd like to have answered, I, I would put it in there now, see if we can get to it. Um, if we don't get to it, just let us know and we'll do our best to answer it offline. I, I do have a question here with regards to your opinion on masks on the gym. I, I think again, as Alessandra has probably stated multiple times that that's gonna need to be a decision for you and your board. Uh, there's the, obviously the capacity issue still hasn't been cleared up with regards to the CDC guidelines, if there are any capacity issues or not. Um, but those are business decisions that you're going to need to make. Also, it also depends on the size of your gym. You know, we have many associations that have a small gym that's only designed for six or seven people. If you have that six or seven people, um, it may not be the right decision for your association because they've lifted the masks. And um, if you've done the same, then you could have an issue there. So these are things that you're gonna have to sit down with council, sit down with management and, and put together at least the ideas and then hopefully get an opinion that, that, um, that you could review and then make the decision that's best for your association. Yeah, and, and that goes, I think, to the earlier question too about the six feet apart, mask off at the gym, you know, it, it's such a comfort level issue because there are no local ordinances. And if the board wants to impose any restrictions, it really depends on the size of your gym, your community, your residents. Are you in a 55 and older community with um, residents that maybe can't be vaccinated or vulnerable? Or are you around kids? I mean, there's so many circumstances that need to be taken into account here. Um, so I, um, there's a few comments that I don't know I don't necessarily question. So going back to the vaccination, you can't, 
Even if you allow owners to voluntarily tell you, yes, I've been vaccinated. The whole point of the order is that you cannot discriminate. You cannot impose a requirement that they be vaccinated in order to do X, Y, Z. So by saying yes, they can voluntarily tell you that, but what about the people that don't wanna tell you yes or no? And then what? So you can't say, well, if you voluntarily tell me that you're vaccinated, then you can go into the pool or you can go into the clubhouse. You can't do that. That would be in violation of the executive order. That would be discriminatory and don't do it. <laughs> and how would you ever prove it's the reality? Again, a lot of these things, you know, the way things are now with PDF and editing and, and all these things. I mean, we've, we've seen um, employees making up that they had COVID uh, test results. So same thing can go, how are you gonna put that pressure on to um, your management staff or your staff if you're self-managed to determine whether that's a proper record or not. And then calls the question of where are you gonna store that record? Are you storing medical records for someone? So there's a lot of complications that, that come with it. And I, I do understand where our governor went with it with that because it, uh, how are we gonna manage that? How are we gonna, there, it's gonna so be many, discriminatory? There's so many different vaccines. Some require two mm -hmm. doses, some require one dose. There's a lot of people coming in with vaccines from other countries. Is your Correct. manager now gonna be required to um, review all of that and determine, is that going to be coming to legal to review and determine I'm going to have to do research on all the different kinds of vaccines to determine if someone is fully vaccinated and, and has waited the 14 days, the 30 days for it to go into full effect. I mean, so many issues come out of that. So, yeah. you know, it, 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 and there is really no remedy if someone lies, um, because you're not supposed to ask anyway. So it shouldn't matter is, is the main goal of that ordinance. So, you know, keeping that in mind, whatever you guys um, pass or approve moving forward needs to keep in mind that it applies equally to those vaccinated and not vaccinated. So if you are someone or if you're bored or your residents don't feel comfortable being in a room with unvaccinated people without a mask, then you need to consider that in your rules and regulations because you can't be asking people if they're vaccinated or not. Correct. Excellent. Well, Alessandra, we're coming up on, on the last minute. I wanted to say if there's any last comments that you have here for, for our board members or managers that, that are attending today. Um, only that I can sympathize with the confusion with the lots of information coming in, you know, really fast. And like you've said numerous times, Rafael, relying on your partners. Go as board members, you guys are not expected to know the ins and outs of what the law provides, um, but you are expected to use your business judgment and rely on the advice of professionals, managers, accountants, lawyers, etc. So really make sure to get the advice of the professionals, make sure to run it by your lawyer, to have that board meeting, to do things by the book, because that's going to protect you as a director. Um, and I applaud all of you guys for taking the time on a weekday to come and to listen to us, trying to explain to you guys some of the nuances. Um, I know it's frustrating and we're frustrated too on our end. So we, we really do understand there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of unknown. So hang in there. We're almost through this. Um, Hopefully we won't be back anytime soon, but we can still do these seminars via Zoom. <laughs> that we're looking forward to. <laughs> so, well, uh, on my behalf, I wanted to thank Alessandra again and, and Josh for, for helping putting this together and for partnering up with us to, to do this webinar. Um, I wanted to thank Ashley as well that works behind the scenes for my team to put this together. And to all the board members and managers, again, as Alessandra stated, I wanna applaud you for taking the time out of your day. It has been frustrating as she stated, both for you guys as well as for us. However, we're hopeful that today's webinar gave you a little bit more clarity. Um, if, you, if you missed anything or you, got, you attended the webinar, uh, arrived a little bit late, uh, we will be sending an email, we'll be posted on, on our YouTube page, we'll post it probably within the next day or two, and you can go ahead and, um, and share that with your board members. On behalf of everyone, I want to thank you again. Uh, my name is Rafael Aquino. Thank you, Alessandra, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me and thank you to Affinity, and it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great one, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.